Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve a temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you with a boundless mercy, and may the sake of a holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of my beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from the Torah, the book of Exodus, the 34th chapter. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter and James. 
James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. They were terrified. 
Terrified because they knew it was death to see God. Terrified like Isaiah before them because they were men of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. In fact, their reactions and the words which escaped Peter's lips, shall I make a tent for you and Moses and Elijah, makes it clear that they have not been listening to Jesus, but instead trusting their own hearts. Remember, in Moses' day, it was death for even an animal to wander onto the holy ground of Mount Sinai, where God revealed himself in the cloud of smoke, fire, thunder, and lightning. It was death for a man, unholy indeed, unrighteous in thought, to come uninvited to God's presence, to be so arrogant as to think that they could come before God and not be punished. See, our sins are like scarlet. We too deserve death, daring to come into the presence of God. That's why we need what Christ revealed, his righteousness, his holiness, interceding for us so that God doesn't see us in our sin. In fact, our sins have been taken as far away from us as east is from the west, all on account of Christ. And yet those disciples hadn't quite understood this. So when the cloud descends and God speaks, their reaction is one of fear. But thanks be to God. God is not all wrath and judgment. The Old Testament isn't all full of God's fire from heaven either. He is merciful as well. Because even today, God in his mercy invites his disciples to come to his holy mountain. But only on his terms and according to his will. And according to his will, he calls to us through the gospel, gathers us in his name, and enlightens us with his gifts. So through his word, listening to Jesus only, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we receive faith and the forgiveness of our sins, all on account of our Lord's suffering and death. Even his incarnation is part of his suffering. As God humbles himself to endure all things, fulfill all righteousness for us. Because Christ Jesus came to be the obedient Son of God. To live the perfect life in our stead. So that he could die upon the cross, hanging there, bearing our sins in his flesh. You see, this is nothing other than the realization that we have a Savior who has come for us died for us, shed his blood for us <clears throat> while we were yet sinners and enemies of God so that we would be made his people and able to come into his presence. Again, not by any strength, worthiness, or merit on our part, but again, all on account of the mercy of God. And this truth, that God is merciful, that he's the one who calls, gathers, enlightens, invites, and even comes to meet with his people, has been revealed to us through the prophets, such as Moses, who had sinned against God by killing an Egyptian, hiding his body, and literally trying to get away with murder. Like Moses, who did not go into the promised land because he had sinned against God in Meribah by not listening to the Lord, by not trusting the word which God had given him to speak to the rock, but instead taking matters into his own hands, struck it, we too have tried to hide all manner of our sins in our hearts, burying them and locking them away. We too have wanted to ignore what God speaks to us through his word and take our lives, our salvation, and our forgiveness into our own hands, trusting ourselves and our feelings rather than trusting the objective, unchanging word of God. If this were not true, then why would so many of us, me included, be so ignorant of what God truly speaks to us through his word. If it wasn't for our heart and hearts, why would it be so hard for us to make time for church and the word of God, to listen to Jesus? And even Elijah, who was the great prophet, who was there watching fire from heaven come down and burn up the altars of Baal, and those prophets of Baal, who was there when those prophets were put to death, he ran away in fear because he was trusting his own strength, not trusting the word of the Lord. Elijah had his 
moments of doubt, fearful despair, thinking that he was the last of the prophets. Even as that reveals our own fears. For we too have been guilty of thinking the Lord has abandoned us at times. Again, looking at the world around us rather than trusting and listening to the word of God. And even we who've had the word preached in its fullness and the teachings of the prophets and the apostles declared among us and the sacraments given to us, we too can have our moments of fear and doubt, wondering if God is truly for us or against us on account of our sins and the problems that we encounter in this life. And yet the Lord is merciful. He still comes to us. He has assured us that our sins have been forgiven. And even Peter, who confirmed that he had heard the voice from heaven on the holy mountain, tells us we have something even more sure than a voice speaking from heaven. Because when we're tempted to listen to voices and the feelings of our heart, we remember what Peter said. He said that we have something more sure, the prophetic word, the word that does not change. The word that was revealed to the apostles and the prophets as they were inspired by God to record these words for us so that in these last days we would not trust in what we see but to what we hear and receive from God. Many people think, if only I could hear God with my own ears, then I would believe. Many people think that what they do hear from their own hearts is God speaking when in fact it is not. But again, what does the apostle who did hear say? Again, we have something more sure, more trustworthy, more solid. We have the unchanging words of the prophets and the apostles handed down to us from heaven. And the Holy Spirit, the Christ himself. Because Christ is the word made flesh. Words written for us to hang on to, to hear, to teach, and to bear witness to with our confession. Because the word of God to which we cling and bind our faith is from God himself and not from any man. Unfortunately, Peter, who was there with Jesus and James and John, eyewitnesses seeing Moses and Elijah with their own eyes, they too continued to fall into sin. Peter even fell into unbelief when he denied Christ three times as Jesus was being led away to be crucified, obviously forgetting and not trusting what Jesus said, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and die at the hands of lawless men. He'd forgotten that word of promise. Jesus would rise again. Peter had seen and heard our Lord tell of his own suffering and death, and again, even the promise of the resurrection, could not believe the reality of what his own eyes were seeing, forgetting Jesus was transformed, revealing his divine nature, forgetting that Christ had to suffer these things, and that because he was God in the flesh, he could bear our sins, needed to bear our sins, because from, apart from Christ going to the cross, we would be lost eternally, each one of us. But the reality of Jesus' crucifixion and death overshadowed it all, even as suffering and death often shakes our faith. That's why we must never trust our own hearts, our own minds, or even our own eyes, but rather the Word of God alone. And because of our weak faith, we too have to be made holy and by God and given faith by Him Himself. Remember, the wages of sin is death. And if anyone is guilty of even one point of the law, he stands guilty of the whole thing. Judged and condemned. And guilty, condemned to hell. Even by our so-called righteous acts, we are still tainted by sin so that no one dare try to come to God on this own. And yet having been forgiven your sins, declared righteous and made holy, justified by grace through faith alone, you are able to come before God without fear. Because again, these are his gifts given to you. Now the people of God were fearful back in the days of Moses. Even the apostles were afraid, understanding the law and the condemnation that they were under apart from Christ. And yet, after Israel had sinned greatly, the scriptures tell us in the Torah that the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Thanks be to God. 
God's loving kindness and mercy has been shown to you in the true blood of the final sacrifice, Lamb of God, God's own Son. In His blood, made over you at the sign of the cross at your baptism with water and the Word, you have been covered in Christ, in God's own righteousness. With the words of Christ spoken to you by Christ Himself through your pastors, God's own called servant has declared to you how you have been made worthy by God himself to come into his presence, to come upon his holy mountain and dine with him there. Even as God invited the people of God up on that mountain to dine with him. Invited by God, you who are blessed to be called his people are allowed to come and be in his presence even as he comes here and reveals himself to you in the words of the sacraments. Because God is divine in Christ. God, true man and true God together in that one person. We have the love and mercy of God revealed to us. In the pure waters of our baptism, our sins have been washed away because we've been drenched in Christ. And of course, you've been given the meal of his body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins, not merely as a memorial with all the grace and mercy of God stripped away, that you have received the full blessing of the Lord's sacrifice, his death and resurrection, placed into your hands as you hold the body of the Lord and that bread, and you taste his blood upon your lips, revealed to you in a way just as miraculous and amazing as God revealed himself to those disciples on that mountain so long ago. And in that preaching of the gospel, in that meal, in those waters, you need not fear. For what the Lord did out of love, he has given to you. And just as God spoke to the disciples, we too are to listen to his son. Heed his words, trust his voice, speaking to us through the word. So we will repent of our sins which are against him and rejoice in his words of eternal life that declare us forgiven, not guilty. Because your Lord Jesus, he's the one with whom the Father is pleased because he is the beloved, sinless, obedient Son of God. He knows no evil, he does no wickedness, and in his obedience to his Father, he chooses to give his righteousness to you so that again, God the Father in heaven sees you as his obedient children as well. What Jesus does in bearing your sin, he does it for you and for the whole world. What he does in defeating death and the grave, he does for each one of you despite your disobedience and ignorance of his word. What he does in rising from the dead, he does so the devil and eternal death may not claim you. Because he has claimed you as his own. Despite your weak faith and my weak faith, despite our hearts that love to sin in our ears, that would rather not hear his words, Lord still comes to us, reveals to himself to us, shows us that even before the foundation of the world which he created, in his creative word, he has created eternal life, faith, forgiveness, and salvation for you. And his glorious transfiguration reveals his divine nature so that we would not fear but trust that even one day we too will be transformed and made glorious even as he is risen from the dead. Jesus told those cowering disciples to rise and have no fear. They could stand in God's presence because he was with them. We too can take comfort in knowing that we too can stand before the Lord, not in arrogance or pride, but in great humility of all that the Lord has done for us. That you can purify, again, not by our strength, but purely because of his mercy. The blessed words of the gospel the Lord has given us as he gently assures us that we have peace with God through him. And that's why when the disciples looked up, they saw Jesus only on the holy mountain. Luther one time said that we don't want to look to the majesty of God that terrifies, but rather to God who hangs upon the cross in the flesh. And so we do. We look to Christ only to see God's love and mercy for us. Because it does come to us only through Him. We're not going to the law for our comfort, but to Jesus only. And we're to know that all prophecy from Moses and Elijah and all the other prophets point us to Jesus as our Savior. Therefore, He places Himself before our eyes and in our ears to His Word 
So just as the disciples looked up and saw Jesus calling, to Christ alone are we to look for our salvation. So we need not fear the judgment day or even our own death. For we know that again we have been declared righteous already. So that when we do face that last day and draw our last breath, we pray that God's word is on our lips as we confess Christ until the end. And that's why you need not fear his divine glory. Because your Lord has come down in such a humble way, choosing to die for you. And because you cannot come to him, he places himself here for you. His very divine self in the flesh, giving himself to you so that you can be strengthened as you remain here awaiting him. Because just as it has always been for Israel, the people of God, you are his church. His called out ones, called to be with him on a holy mountain. Well, this isn't necessarily an uplifted place. It is a place where you are uplifted before God as the word dwells in you and you are made righteous and declared holy and justified. All because he has chosen to reveal himself to you and make you his own dear people. And now, not just Moses, Elijah, Peter, Paul, and John, but the multitude of God's people see him revealed through his word and the sacraments, even as we will one day see him face to face. When the cloud of our sin is permanently lifted, the veil of death is thrown aside, removed with all of our sins, so that with our own glorified bodies, we participate in that unending feast of his glorious, eternal, heavenly banquet, where we too will shine like the sun. And until then, we reflect his divine glory in our lives, shining upon our faces, we hear his word spoken to us. St. John records in his revelation that Having been saved by Christ, clothed in his righteousness, our garments will be white. Now we see that dingy covering of sin, but the Lord sees us already as his holy people, radiant, and perhaps even dazzling. One day we will stand before the Lamb of God, basking in his light and his glory for all eternity, even as our Lord comes and reveals himself to us this day in his word and gives us the comfort and knowledge that we will not perish but live eternally with him because he has come and met with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <laughs>
watching the Divine Service at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Carlisle, Iowa. Join us this coming Sunday at the Divine Service, which begins at 9 a.m. Our Divine Service is followed by Adult Bible Study and Sunday School at 1030. You're also invited to join us for Vespers and Catechesis for the entire family on Wednesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. We also gather for the morning prayer service of Matins on Thursday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Holy Cross is a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and is located at 1100 Market Street, Carlisle, Iowa.